Well, this Black History Month, CBS and Boston is bringing you a series of interviews with local leaders and figures who have been instrumental in empowering African American voices in Massachusetts. Our Paula Eben spoke with prison reform advocate Conan Harris. Joining us now is Mr. Conan Harris, who is a prison reform advocate. He works with a consulting firm that he began in Boston, and he happens to be the husband of Congresswoman Ayanna Presley. Thanks so much for taking the time to speak with me today. Thank you for having me. Well, first of all, tell us your story. Uh, we know that you've testified, testified on Capitol Hill about prison reform. A and tell us what you want people to know when you testify before a committee in that way. Well, you know, uh, like many Americans, um, especially black Americans, um, you, you know, incarceration, mass incarceration has been a part of our society. And one of the things that I was testifying to was trying to bring awareness to the fact that um, there's many men and women and families that are going through this process together and trying to figure out solutions, creative solutions to make sure people not just get out, but stay out and have real opportunities opportunities of success. And, and you always talk about some key measures that you fought for that are important while someone is still incarcerated, while rehabilitation is going on. And, and why do you feel those are so important for once someone is released? So when I worked for the mayor's office and the public safety office, I was one of the leaders that created the mayor's office of returning citizens. And the mindset of that creation was to be able to make sure people have support services once they return to society. But we all know that getting ready for society starts while you're incarcerated. That's the reason why it's so important and so crucial to have pro-social programming while they exist. I've think that when the Pell Grants was in place for, for people who are incarcerated to go to college and have real opportunities of, for success to be able to reintegrate when they come home, that is a key thing to help people with real opportunities while they're in there. Mm. But the process starts when you're inside, not when you get out. And job training is a big piece of that, right? Absolutely. Job trading. And once you return home, um, housing is an intricate part to your successful reentry. And so job training helps prepare you for a job. But we all know that if you do not have a stable place to rest your head, that's when the problem occurs. So it's so crucial and important to make sure that there's opportunities for have real successful reentry with a place to lay your head down where you can feel safe, get up and go to work and reintegrate into society in a real way. And I know this is crucial because you've talked about the effect that your family had, that you were at the advantage that you had family members, you had a place to stay when you were released, and that to release people to a homeless shelter is no way for them to be able to get a job and reintegrate into society. So how do you think that we can combat that piece of this puzzle? Well, one of the things... Um, for my own personal story is that I share, like many Americans across this country, many black male Americans, um, a part of the criminal legal system, right? And we talk about this every day is figuring out how do we get people to come home and not just get out, but stay out. And, and it's crucial to make sure that they have a stable living environment. I was, you know, I was an ordinary person who had extraordinary support in the, in the hands of my my family, who made sure that I had a stable environment to re-enter into. However, one of the things that is crucial is that we have to be thinking more creatively as it comes to this population when they're coming home. 95% mm. of the population come home from incarceration, and we cannot just try to paint one brush with it by sending them to shelters. We have to think creatively on how we want folks to integrate and get out and stay out and be a part of our community and society as a whole. If there's one thing you could do uh, while someone is still incarcerated to help them in terms of that housing piece, what do you think is the most helpful measure that cities and communities could engage in? I would look, I would create six months 
um, it, setting people up for success will create, and once they come home, um, giving them six months to stay inside and stay inside a space that is safe, um, reentry housing, mm -hmm. um, so they can get all the resources that they need while they're in there. I don't think that you just house them. I think that it comes with a resource added, where people get the job training, where people get help to find employment, where people get help inside counseling. Um, all these things that will help for a person to address the issues that they engage with and have they have internally, but also set them up for success with employment opportunities and get them on a on, get them on a pathway for real opportunity yeah. and to get their own once they're home. It's certainly so crucial. I, I do a lot of work with Bridge Over Troubled Waters in Boston, which of course helps a lot of homeless teens. And yes. you know, and it's a similar situation. They just they need someone to for for their age group act as a parent to help them finish their GED, get a job, get to an apartment, and there is transitional housing there that that needs to happen. That transitional housing is crucial to helping people, one, get a leg up, but also help them be successful during their reentry process. That is going to be crucial. Yeah. I do have to ask, I know you tested positive recently for coronavirus. How are you feeling? And uh, if you don't mind, what was your experience with the illness? So um, I thank God um, that I had mild symptoms, and I just want to take a moment to say thank you for people who have reached out all across the city, the state, and throughout the country to check on my well-being and make sure that I was okay and checked on my family. Thank God I have mild, um, um, small symptoms, and, and I'm okay. Um, I've been able to get out, um, get away from it, and, and be healthy. Yeah, that's excellent. And, you know, we know so many minority communities are hesitant to get vaccinated. That's what the polling tells us. What's your message to them? I would absolutely tell folks that they absolutely have to get vaccinated. Um, this is this is not a game. This is a real, real um, virus, and it's been taking the lives of so many. So I would absolutely um, push for folks to get vaccinated. But then I would add that you continue to wear your mask and continue to keep social distancing so we can get past this process and through this pandemic collectively. But man, I would, I would push for folks to get vaccinated, but don't just get vaccinated. Keep the same things in place, like wearing your mask and keeping the social distance so we can all get through this as a country. And hopefully it's about getting as many people vaccinated as fast as possible by the fall. We hope so that life can somewhat get back to normal. Uh, we're we're pushing for our legislators and we're pushing for our governor and our president to make sure the most people get vaccinated and the most vulnerable people get the vaccination and stay in steadfast in that movement. Sure. Well, you know, legislature that you can really talk to a lot and keep pressure on <laughs> get all this to work. Conan well, Harris, well, thank you so much for speaking with us today. Appreciate it. Oh, thank you very much for having me. It's an absolute pleasure.